morning, I'm Pastor John. Welcome to Church at Home. Our mission here at Loma Vista is to help people take the next step toward Jesus Christ. We would love to help you take that next step, but may maybe you're not sure what that next step is. Well, I want to encourage you to pray. Pray and ask God what you can do to grow closer to His Son, Jesus Christ, and then expect God to put something on your heart or in your mind. We also have a prayer team that would love to pray for you. Not only pray, lift up your prayers, but to praise God with you for those answered prayers. You can submit a prayer request online at lomavistacc.com. Let's join our worship team as they lead us in worship this morning. All right, hey, good morning, church. We're so glad that you're joining us online this morning. We wanna invite you in the next couple of minutes just to sing about God's goodness and his love for us. Let's sing together. With me in the morning sun, with me when the day is done, the kindness of your heart, the kindness of your heart, and never failing in the night, in your presence I will find the kindness of your heart, the kindness of your heart.
let it breathe It's your name And still Call the sea to still Good morning, I'm Pastor Joe Lavanino. Thanks for joining us for Church at Home. Hey, our leadership is trying to determine when to begin our weekly outdoor in-person church services that are safe and CDC compliant. And we need your help. We've developed a survey designed to help you communicate your comfort level and what safety measures you would like to see in place as we begin meeting. The survey is anonymous. Would you please take 10 minutes at the end of today's service 
and fill out the survey. You can access the survey on our website from your e-bulletin or from the church-wide email that we sent out last week. Thank you so much for helping us do this. So today we're starting a brand new series through the book of 1 Thessalonians called A Faith Worth Sharing. We live in an age in which our culture seems to be shedding its Christian heritage. While the Bible was the major influence on the founding of this country and the development of our nation's morals and laws, it seems we've taken an about face and turned towards more of a secular, pluralistic society. It wasn't that long ago when our country shared a common understanding of the Bible, but now the Bible and Christianity seem to be accused in the least being irrelevant and outdated, and at the most, or the worst, being misogynistic, racist, and ethnocentric. In Blue Like Jazz, Donald Miller talks honestly about his evangelistic misgivings before his faith deepened. He writes, I could not in good conscience tell a friend about a faith that didn't excite me. I couldn't share something I wasn't experiencing, and I wasn't experiencing Christianity. It didn't do anything for me at all. It felt like math, like a system of rights and wrongs and political beliefs, but it wasn't mysterious. It wasn't God reaching out of heaven to do wonderful things in my life. And if I would have shared Christianity with someone at that point, it would have felt mostly like I was trying to get somebody to agree with me rather than to meet God. How can we share our faith in an age and a day when it doesn't have the meat or the teeth that it once had? How can I share a faith that perhaps you may not be convinced it's worth sharing? Am I personally experiencing authentic Christianity? Am I personally convinced that my own faith has made a difference in my own life? Have you ever wondered that? If people are going to consider the claims of Christianity in the Bible, shouldn't it be demonstrated in my own life? And how do I know it is? What are those authentic traits, those biblical traits of genuine faith that, say, the first century church experienced? That's exactly what the Apostle Paul talks about in his opening in chapter 1 of Thessalonians. First of all, we're not in new territory. What we are facing today, the early church and the New Testament authors faced at the turn of the century and wrote very extensively on how God's word and faith in Christ does have the answers for what ails every society in every generation. We will be working our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians as we discover the beauty and the relevancy and the power that the message of Jesus Christ can have in your life and in our world today. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians verses 1 through 10, and we look at the five traits of authentic faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. So Paul opens up his letters, as he does with every letter, by mentioning who the letter's from. Today, we kind of do that at the end of our emails and letters, but that's not how they did it back then. Paul, at the very beginning, says, hey, it's me, Paul, and Silas and Timothy are with me. They're traveling uh, partners that followed Paul around on his second missionary journey. You could look up online, Google second missionary maps to see where Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveled. But here they're writing this letter to the Thessalonians. They had just left the Thessalonians, and they wanted to make sure that the church is doing very well. And this city, Thessalonica, was a city in what's modern-day, today modern-day Greece, and it was made up of several house churches, and it had a very hostile environment. To be a Christian in Thessalonica in the first century was very different than being a Christian today. Back then, during Paul's day, if you claimed to be a Christian, you could be harassed, you could be persecuted, you could be oppressed, you could be arrested, you could be chased out of town 
And essentially, that's what happened to Paul, Silas, and Timothy as they preached in the synagogues in Thessalonica. There were, was such a great opposition that they raised up this violent mob to arrest Paul and Silas and Timothy. They escaped, and they ran away. You could read about this in Acts chapter 17, by the way. So they escaped, and this mob turned and started arresting the Christians that stayed in Thessalonica. So it was a sad day to be a Christian back then in that town. So Paul, after escaping, turns around and writes this letter and sends it back to these Christians that probably are huddling in their homes. And that's kind of where we're picking up. And he includes grace and peace to you. You see that there in first one. A common greeting in Paul's letter. We discovered this in the letter of Philemon. Why he includes grace and peace. Grace was the typical greeting that the Greek Christians shared with one another. Peace was a typical greeting that the Jewish Christians shared with one another. So the church was filling up with both Greek Greek converts and Jewish converts, and Paul wanted to make both feel at home. Both were just accepted into the family of God. Both had equal rights and equal standing, and so Paul wanted to be very inclusive in his greeting. Verse 2 and 3, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Circle three words for me if you can, if you're taking notes, if you have your Bibles open. Work produced by faith, uh, uh, labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. Faith, love, and hope. This is a common triad that Paul includes in a lot of his New Testament letters. It's sort of his way of measuring if a faith was authentic or not. When a person accepted Christ into their lives, their lives didn't change overnight, but you could gradually see faith, hope, and love begin to express itself through their lives. And you see that in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, let us uh, put on our faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, he writes, and now these three things remain forever, faith, hope, and love. In Romans 5, he says, we have access to, access to God through faith. We rejoice in the hope of God, and hope dis doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. So you could see Paul's thinking here as he writes these New Testament letters. Faith, hope, and love are, are three basic handles on testing whether or not a person's faith was authentic. So let's, let's break those down as we take a look at the five authentic traits, uh, five traits of authentic faith. Uh, that first phrase, a work produced by faith. A work produced by faith. In the original language, the language Paul spoke, the word work was ergon, which means employment. It means being productive. It means accomplishing things. In the English, we get the word ergonomics, which means something that's designed to help you create an efficient workplace. And that's what Paul is saying, that your faith has efficiency. Your faith has productive um, actions. Your, your faith is producing good works. And in Paul's economy, if your faith is genuine, it's going to produce good works, good accomplishments for the kingdom of God. And that's trait number one in your outline. Write this down. Trait number one uh, along the five traits of authentic faith is it's a faith that produces good works. A faith that produces good works. And he's complimenting the Thessalonian Christians. He's saying you, he was so moved by all the activity for the kingdom of God that he saw there in Thessalonica. And that jives with James chapter 2, verse 14 on your outline. It says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? In other words, if you say you're a Christian and there's really no fruit, no works, no production, do you really have genuine faith? And then later in verse 26, he says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. So that's one way, one label that Paul gives us and the Apostle James gave us to determine whether or not our faith is authentic. I remember when I accepted Christ uh, way back in my younger days, I, I remember the first time feeling desire 
and passion and an impulse to make a difference in, in someone else's life. Jesus had just forgiven me of a whole list of things. And that sensation of being forgiven produced this passion to share this good news with others who don't know that they can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so I got involved in a college group at the, at the church I was a part of. I got involved uh, in the youth department and I helped the youth pastor pull off youth events and it was a blast. I had so much fun and I felt like I was making a difference. I later formed a Christian band and we traveled and we shared our music and testimonies through our music. And then later on I started teaching and it was rough at first, but I felt like I was making a difference. I was productive, I was active. And I think that's exactly what Paul is saying, your work produced by faith. Now works doesn't make us saved, but our salvation does produce works. It comes after our our salvation. So genuine faith is a faith that produces good works. That's our first trait. Let's go on to verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, We continually remember your works produced by faith, but also your labor prompted by love. Your labor prompted by love. Uh, love is agape in the Greek, in Paul's language that he spoke. It means an other-centered, sacrificial type of love. It's an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. And you know, quite honestly, that imperfect person that is the object of our love can create sort of a laborious experience for us, right? Because no two people are identical. Even married people uh, don't see eye to eye on everything. And marriage is an exercise of of a labor of love. And when we get together and worship together as a church family, not everyone's going to see everything the same way. And so there are some things we're attracted to, but, uh, you know, the gap there is where agape comes in, where love comes in. And he calls it a labor of love. He attaches the word labor because Paul knows it takes a lot of work. We use the term labor to describe giving birth to a child. Uh, We call it labor pains. And so we kind of agree with what Paul is saying here, that if we really want to have agape, agape love for someone, an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person, we just know it's going to take work. We just know it's going to take effort. And that's the second trait of authentic faith in your outlines. Number two, a love that helps me be patient with others. A love that helps me be patient with others. And he commends the Thessalonian church, boy, you sure have patience with one another. You're enduring and the differences that you see in each other and you're just sticking in there and being loyal. Take a look on your outline, 1 John 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. In other words, God is spirit and no one can see him. He's invisible. But the more I love you and the more you love me and put up with me and have patience with me, other people can see God in in us as we love. And it says his love is made complete in us. It's like a muscle that we exercise. When we come to Christ, he gives us the ability to produce this labor of love. And the more we do it, he makes that love complete. He fills it up. He perfects it. So it grows. You know, I have to admit, uh, it's, it's easy to watch sports or news or even the social media feeds and get really, really irritated. I think we live in a day and age where we kind of get irritated with one another based on what tribe we're a part of, how we vote, uh, how we see life. And sometimes I get off, you know, my social media feeds and I find myself getting angry and I realize I got to stop doing that. I got to stop... Um, allowing my emotional state be dictated by what's going on in our world. I have to stop, I have to center in to what Christ is doing in my life and trust he's gonna give me love and patience and endurance with people who aren't like me. And that's how Christians can stand out in this world. That's how our faith can be attractive in this world. The endurance and the love that he gets, gives us in Christ to have patience with one another. So that's trait number two. Well, let's go on to trait number three. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, we constantly or continually remember your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and number three, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He uses this term endurance inspired by hope. So he says that hope is uh, what is producing this endurance. As you go through these hardships, as you go through the suffering of people attacking you for being associated with Jesus, your hope is helping you endure. So what does hope mean for the Christ follower? Hope means simply to anticipate something. Not to wish something would happen, but once you've been promised something, the hope that you have is anticipating that the promise happens. So for instance, you take your car to a mechanic that you trust. And say you've known this mechanic for many, many years. Pam and I have a family mechanic. He's earned our trust. Uh, When he says he can fix it, he's given us a promise that he'll fix it, he'll do it right, and he won't gouge us with the price. So we put our faith, our trust in our mechanic. We have trust in his promise. That's what faith is. Faith is trust. And as our car is being fixed, we may rent another car. We may take our bike. We may carpool together. Who knows? And as he works on our car for that whole week, we are anticipating our car to be done. And that's what hope is. Faith is trusting that he's going to fix it. Hope is the anticipation that he's going to call us very soon and say, your car's ready to be picked up. That's how faith and hope work together. Faith is trust. Hope is anticipation. So when Paul says, you have this hope in Jesus Christ that's causing you endure, what is he saying? He's saying that you trust the promises of God so much that you anticipate them coming true in your life, and that's giving you endurance. So when Jesus says, don't worry, I'll give you the strength to suffer, they're anticipating that strength to come. Don't worry, I'll give you the love to love those you you don't love and and endure and have patience with each other. Hope is anticipating that God will give you what you need to get through the day. That's what the power of hope. It's anticipating that what the Bible has promised you will actually come true. So hope gives you a sense of confidence in your tomorrow. It gives you a sense of confidence in your today. And as non-believers look at you and they look at your confidence and they look at your hope, that's gonna attract them. So that's trait number three. Authentic faith produces, number three, a hope that gives me confidence in my future. Confidence in my future. 2020 has been a rough year for all of us. Um, and we see all these funny memes that wish, you know, 2020 could just kind of vanish and go away. Now, obviously, we've been dealing with COVID, and we may know people that have wrestled with COVID. We know, probably know a lot of people have been impacted by COVID. Um, we see people arguing about whether or not to wear a mask, and people are screaming and yelling at each other. Um, we see African Americans suffer needlessly. Uh, We see policemen and law enforcement suffer needlessly. Um, We see that the uh, economy has taken a huge hit and not sure if we're going to have a job in the next month. They're talking about these killer hornets descending on us and I have no idea what those are about but that's what they're talking about. Now people are saying they're receiving mysterious seeds from China and we're thinking what else can go wrong? 2020 has just been a an anxiety-ridden year, and people are afraid, and people need hope. And when you walk with your head held up high, not being oblivious to the hardship, but embracing it, and knowing that Christ is with you in the midst of your hardship, it's gonna give you confidence. As you anticipate God moving in your life, people are gonna be attracted to that. Don't underestimate the attractiveness of your Christ-centered hope. Don't underestimate that. People are going to be drawn to that. And at one point, they may ask you to give an answer for the hope that you have within you, and you'll have an opportunity to do it with patience and gentleness and respect. Romans 5, verse 3 through 5 says, We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope doesn't disappoint, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Okay, so we have the the, the famous triad of Paul. Authentic faith produces uh, a faith, a love, and a hope. Let's go on to trait number four, found in verses four through five. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. 
When he says the gospel, he's meaning the good news of Christ, that Christ can forgive you, he died for you, he, he can redeem your life. So that's what he means when he says the gospel. But he says here in this verse that when he was with the Thessalonians, he noticed that they had power, that they had the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that they had this deep, abiding conviction. In other words, it wasn't just faith that came from words. It wasn't just faith that came from, you know, a label or identification. It was demonstrated in their lives through power. That word in the original language is dunamis, where we get the word dynamic. So they had this dynamic, this dynamism that was different from non-Christians. It was this dynamic this, 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 this life, this dynamism that existed inside of them. Paul knew it came from the Holy Spirit, and he says that as a, it came with the Holy Spirit. And then he also noticed they had deep convictions, this unshakable assurance. They were convinced that Christ was real beyond all doubt, and they were experiencing his Holy Spirit in their lives as they huddled together and worked through the suffering that they were facing. They weren't afraid of standing out, even if it meant being persecuted. They didn't hide or recant their faith in Christ. They didn't try to abandon their Christ-like traits to look more like the world. They weren't afraid to swim against the tide. They weren't afraid to stand out in this culture that was hostile to their faith. Where did they get their conviction? Where did they get their dynamism? From the Holy Spirit. And that's trait number four of authentic faith. It's a conviction that keeps me grounded. Trait number four, a conviction that keeps me grounded. You know you are genuinely saved when you feel a groundedness, an unshakable confidence that says, I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you do to me. I know who I have believed in. And I'm confident he will keep me. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.12 says, that is why I am suffering as I am. Paul says, yet I am not ashamed. And here's that verse, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. So what Paul is basically saying is, it's a done deal in my mind. You can waffle and debate and argue about what's true and what's, and what's not true. I know what's true. God's word is true. And it's made a change in my life. And I've entrusted to him my future, and my reputation, and my entire life. That's what Paul's saying here. I know who I believe, and I am convinced he's able to guard and keep until that day when either I die or Jesus comes back. Pam and I watched a movie about Harriet Tubman. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's a great movie. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery on in, in a Maryland plantation in 1822. When Harriet was about 26 years old, she learned that she might be sold away from her family. So she knew the time had come to try to escape. So she made her way some 90 miles north along the Underground Railroad. She traveled at night to avoid slave catchers, following the North Star, until she reached Pennsylvania and freedom. And once there, she dared to make a dangerous decision She could have stayed in the comfort and safety of her freedom, but she didn't. She decided to risk her own freedom in order to give others theirs. And so for the next eight years, she led scores of slaves north to freedom. And during these trips, she relied upon God to guide and protect her. She never once lost a runaway slave. And as Harriet herself later put it, quote, I never ran my track off the track, my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. She gave all the credit to God, and she continues to explain, Twent me, twas the Lord. I always told him, I trust to you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me. And he always did. Her faith, her unshakable faith, deeply impressed others. And this genuine faith not only earned the freedom for scores and scores of slaves, but her faith in Christ stood out as a personal testimony to win others over. A conviction that keeps you grounded. That's a trait of genuine faith. Let's do the last trait. It's found in verse 6. 
Paul tells the Thessalonians, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In other words, they were very careful to follow Paul's example as he lived with them. And of the Lord, of what they knew Jesus to be like when he was alive. Uh, This letter was written probably about 30 to 50 years after Jesus had been crucified. But enough stories had had been passed around for them to understand how Jesus lived. And so they sought to realign their lives around the example they understood of Jesus, but also the physical presence of Paul when he was there. He says, in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. That sounds odd. He uses the term severe suffering, not just suffering, and not just hardship, but suffering, and not just suffering, severe suffering. And yet in the midst of their severe suffering, they had joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul saw that with them. How can we have joy in the midst of hardship? How can we have joy in the midst of people making fun of us or unfriending us or accusing us of things? That severe suffering and that joy that followed that severe suffering came from the Holy Spirit. Once the Thessalonians had accepted Christ, they had a target on their back, probably very much the way you might feel you do today. And they stood out from culture. They no longer fit in. As soon as they repented of their sin and followed scripture, that put a target on their back. That makes you and I stand out just as it did them. They no longer blended in. They no longer went with a flow. They no longer worshiped what the culture worshiped. They no longer bought into the lies that deceived people around them. Their faith in Jesus caused them to forsake all others and to stand out and have a target. And so people, as a consequence, made fun of them, demeaned them, ridiculed them, harassed them, hurt them, arrested them, and punished them. This severe suffering was active persecution with the intent of breaking their will, changing their mind, and getting them to recant their faith in Jesus. But it didn't. Look in verse 7 and 8. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia and Achaia were sort of the regions or the the county. If you think of Thessalonica as a city or a town, then Macedonia and Achaia are sort of the counties. So Paul is saying, boy, you guys are so faithful that word about you is spreading to the counties. And you are becoming an inspiration, a model for all the believers in those counties. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. So Paul is saying it's not even limited, your reputation for being faithful and authentic is not even limited to the counties. It's going beyond the counties, and Paul should know because he's traveling all around the world. Man, how do we get faith like that? How do we know if we go through suffering, we're going to experience joy to stand tall and strong. It says the Lord's message rang out. It wasn't the Thessalonians' message. It wasn't Paul's message. It was the, Lord, the message about Jesus. So their lives were like a flower. You step on the petals and it, it emits this beautiful aroma. When those Thessalonians were being crushed, it emitted this beautiful aroma of Christ. And it, that, that aroma wafted throughout the known world. And people began asking questions, not about Thessalonians or Paul, but about Jesus. About Jesus. And that's trait number five. And this may not be an attractive trait to you. You may may not want to say, oh, I want trait number five, but it comes with our faith. Trait number five, trait of genuine, authentic faith is a strength to suffer well. A strength to suffer well. Years ago, I still remember interviewing a member of our church. At that time, she was well into her 70s, and her body was bent over, and her joints swollen and distorted from rheumatoid arthritis. She couldn't accomplish much at all during the day. And when I asked her to share her testimony, she had this great smile on her face and said, I would love to. The day came when she uh, was to share with the rest of our church. Why is she so joyous in the midst of all that pain? And as she got up from her seat, the time came for her to share testimony. She got up from her seat, and it took a while for her to negotiate those two or three steps to get on the stage. And, but once she did, she spoke of a faith so real 
and so meaningful for her. She wasn't bitter. She wasn't angry because of her rheumatoid arthritis. She wasn't angry at God, expecting that, you know, why didn't you heal me? There was this quiet joy and this obvious confidence she had in Jesus. She spoke of Jesus as if he was her best friend. She spoke of Jesus as if she had had coffee with him earlier that morning. That's how personal her faith was. There was a joy, a confidence, a strength inspired all of us. That's suffering well. That's suffering well. Look on your outline, 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, our bodies are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. That joy, that love, that faith, that hope continues to grow no matter what happens to these bodies. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Not on the rheumatoid arthritis, but what is going on inside my heart. Jesus in me, the hope of glory. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When you're suffering, people are going to wonder, how in the world can you believe in a God that doesn't protect you? You know, when you're suffering, people are going to say, how can you be convinced that God is real when all these bad things are happening to you? They'll ask you, if your God loves you, couldn't he just stop your suffering? You're going to get hit with all kinds of criticisms as you suffer. God never promises us that our lives will never be faced with suffering. Quite the opposite, that when suffering does find us, he'll be there right with us, right there, producing good things in the midst of bad. And when we suffer for Christ, or when we suffer in general and Christ is a part of our lives, that is a moment where we're going to be on the stage, like my 70-year-old friend. People are going to watch you. They're going to watch to see how you suffer. God can create good out of bad. God can carry me when I feel like collapsing. God is working in my life when I feel alone and abandoned. Uh, suffering as a believer is rarefied air in which God can do the most work in us than in any other situation. Hardship can be the soil that produces the most fruit in our lives. A genuine faith will change the way you and I approach suffering and it will give God glory. Well, those are the five traits. A faith that produces works, a love that gives me patience with others, a hope that gives me confidence in my future, a, co a conviction that keeps me grounded, and a strength that helps me suffer well. Ray Steadman wrote a book, Authentic Christianity, and he states this, the authentic Christian life is essentially and radically different from the natural life lived by a man or a woman. Outwardly, it can be very much the same, but inwardly, the basis of living is dramatically different. Christ is a part of every wholesome action, the corrector of every wrong deed or thought, the giver of joy and the healer of hurt. No longer merely on the edges of life, Christ is in the center of everything. Life revolves around him. As a consequence, life comes into proper focus. Despite outward trials, a deep peace possesses the Christian heart. Strength grips the spirit, and kindness and joy radiate abroad. That is really living, end quote. And in our faith in Jesus, if it, if it is authentic faith, I like the way he put it, Jesus goes from the margins to the center, Jesus stops being an accessory or a label of my life and becomes the Pentium chip. He becomes the pilot. He becomes the compass, the North Star that rules my life, that dictates every, every thought and every action. Jesus becomes the one I worship. And he doesn't take second place. He takes the only place in my heart. And I pray, I pray that during this series, we can... You know, yes, it's about evangelism and, and it's a faith we're sharing, but really what's really important to me is that you see Christ in you. 
that you see the Holy Spirit, you see the courage well up inside of you, the love that wasn't there before, the faith and the hope that wasn't there. I pray that I sort of evangelize you and me as we open up 1 Thessalonians. I pray we can be convinced that our faith is real and genuine and that we don't ignore those signals and we don't just gloss over the significant work in our life that the Holy Spirit has wrought through the presence of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for this series. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to fill out the survey. Uh, fill it out today. That will give us direction as we continue to negotiate our way through these unique times. Thank you, Loma Vista, for watching. As we conclude our service this morning, I just want to thank you for your faithful giving and supporting our ministries here at Loma Vista. If you would like to support Loma Vista and its ministries or our building project, you can still contribute online or via text or even in the mail. Don't forget to take the survey that Pastor Joe told us about. We really value your input as we make decisions about how best to serve you and our community. You can find the survey on our website, your, a link in your e-bulletin, or in your email if you've given us your contact info. Thank you for joining us today. May God bless you and draw you closer to His Son Jesus.